Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with episode number 102 of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A, coming to you from the whole, from, well, <laughs> I always want to say from the whole van, but uh, yeah, okay. Welcome back, Rabbi. It's good to see you. Been missing you. <coughs> I know everybody else has. Welcome back. It's great to be here. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have me. Yeah, of course it is. Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. All right, so that's good deal. Good deal. Good deal, man. Uh, wow. So before we even get too far down the road, what I would like for you to do is to let us all know uh, how our schedule is going to be coming up uh, during the game, during these uh, holy days mm. coming up. Have you have you kind of mapped that out yet to see uh, what the days are going to end up being? Because I know. Yeah, we'll be on. We'll be on, if you. I think we'll, we'll be on Sunday. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll be on Sunday. Okay, so here here's going to be the goal for um, for what's coming up this week, uh, unless uh, until until further notice or unless another notice comes in. Um, yeah. Next Sunday we will also record, um, and I'm on, I'm going to try to get back on a weekly schedule with this show. It'll have to be with this show only. It's the only one I can actually fit in on an every week basis. Um, but it still may not be consistent. So, and during these holidays, it may be a little a little etchy too uh trying to figure out yeah, what, what day we can and what day we can't so very etchy. um so anyway just uh, keep that in mind and so um but yeah it's good to be back in the studio with you rabbi and uh can't wait to get moving on so uh, oh yeah i guess i should open up the phone lines just so people can call in if they wish yeah that would be nice <laughs> and we are now signed <coughs> in so phone lines are open i'll be clearing my throat constantly making all these uh, bodily noises during the show. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll be healed soon. Yeah, thank Maybe you. Later. Okay, so there we go. There we go. All right, numbers on your screen. It'll come back on your screen here in just a minute under a different format. And so uh, before we get going, uh, I would like to also uh, let everybody know, um, because sometimes I've, I've failed to actually go through this, but <clears throat> there's some really, really good resources um, here with with Rabbi Singer, and I I still haven't actually opened this or cracked this book yet. Let me see if I can put it up here where you can see it. Oh yeah, actually I may not have to switch screens because that's actually pretty clear. Uh, Rabbi versus the chaplain. Didn't there a video of? I'm not sure. There may be a video on YouTube of this, but this is a, a real thin read, uh, pretty interesting. And then you've got uh, Rabbi Singer. Let me see. Flip this thing. I'm still not used to holding things up in the camera because what I see is mirrored of what what everybody else sees. Okay, exploring fascinating prophetic dimensions hidden in the book of Chronicles. Really cool. And then live from Jerusalem, four-part uh, collection. This is this is really neat because you get to see Rabbi talking and walking back and forth on the stage or in the stage area and interacting with people. Very cool. He also has a copy of this there, the Disputation, at the website, which is really cool. Um, <coughs> if you haven't seen this, it, you're really missing. That's pretty cool. Um, and then also uh, the the a debate with Rabbi Tobias Singer and Pastor Paul Humber. Uh, from uh, from a little bit back, and so all that's available, along with his two part uh, book, hardcover and soft cover, both available. Uh, CDs not available right now. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Not sure. But the audio files are. Go to the website. <laughs> right? <laughs> are you planning on making new ones, or are you reading something funny? <laughs> if no, you just very. Cute. I'm very. Uh, <laughs> just go right ahead. Go to the website uh, outreachjudaism.org. Look in the uh, I believe it's free audio titled in, in the top right tab somewhere. If you click on that, you'll find all the audio files that will uh, that will go quite well with these books. They're, they they go hand in hand. So, all right, Rabbi. Well, with that said, I guess we'll kick this thing off. And uh, let's see, where is my phone number? There it is right there. Phone number, phone number's on your screen. Eight five five nine five Bible. Eight five five nine five two four two five three. So, give us a call. Uh, tell us what your question is. And no, this is not the phone line for some Medicare health plan. I cannot tell you how many phone call messages I get during off hours, message after message. Like, yes, I would like to check in on the uh, seniors over sixty or whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but. Uh, and it's funny is there's a voicemail telling you this is not MediShare. This is actually, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they're just wishful thinking. So, all right. Uh, let's see what we got here. So since we don't have a phone call just yet, what we'll do, I don't think we did. I had the volume down. Uh, what we'll do is I'll kick off this first one with a phone call. Oh, there you go. Hey, hey, hey. timing is everything. Yeah. All right. Welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. 
Caller, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you are live on the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Okay, I'm uh, Pinchas. I'm calling from Canada. Welcome. Welcome to the show, Pinchas. Okay, I, I have a question. I, I listened to a previous show when the rabbi was talking about uh, Jeremiah, and he was uh, saying that... Uh, uh, there, there, are, there are some pasuks that are talking about the, the lying scribes. So it, it shows that uh, uh, criticism was already quite widespread. People were not happy with the establishment. In a way, Jesus, with uh, uh, his criticism, essentially repeating the same uh, uh, lines. I uh, would be interested to hear the rabbi's opinion about that and what really happened to Christianity, why did they uh, uh, left Judaism rather than uh, sticking with, with the law. Because essentially what, what Jeremiah was saying and what Jesus was saying at the beginning, that the law is correct. It's the people who are practicing the law, people, you know, the lying scribes that actually distorting the original law. Rev, are you clear on that question? Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, very good. Thank you for your call, I, um, And uh, just to I am very, good. very clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, phone lines are back up, and if you call right now, uh, be prepared to be on hold. Do not hang up. Once you hang up, you're just going to completely lose your place in line. So uh, just hang on. Uh, keep the phone close to your ear because there's about a 20 to 30 second lag in what you're seeing and what you're hearing, what's, what's actually going on live in the studio. So sit close by your phone. And, uh, Rabbi, I'll pass it along to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is one of those questions where I don't know where to begin. The question is that in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, uh, the prophet said, uh, Jeremiah lived toward the end of the first temple period, and he said, how could you say that we are wise? Um, we have uh, the law of the Lord, when actually the lying pen of the scribes has uh, handled it falsely. That's the basic text. A very famous passage. And if a person reads this out of context, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. The questioner... Are you still on? Question, okay, sorry, go ahead. Okay. The questioner is... In this case, he is uh, referencing the Christian Bible where uh, he is saying that essentially the scribes uh, and the Pharisees, which are in the Christian Bible interchangeable, are hypocrites and vipers. So it would appear that Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, seems to support the Christian Bible. That's how I understand uh, this, the question that's being asked here. Um, this is a very, very unusual exegesis. In fact, it's the first time I've ever heard it. Jeremiah 8, verse 8, is usually misconstrued uh, in a completely different way, in that uh, people who claim that Tanakh had been corrupted, the Jewish scriptures, has been changed, so they will point to this passage and say, you see here, the Torah was altered, the Torah was changed, and Jeremiah is telling us that. Okay, okay so that so this is a, a very interesting spin. Uh, usually Christians uh, who oppose that position are not sure what to do with Jeremiah 8, verse 8. But what I think I need to do here, what I must do here, is explain what's going on. 
Who is Jeremiah speaking about? Who are these lying scribes? Um, Who are they? Who's lying? And in fact, if you look up the word sheker in the in the book of Jeremiah, if you look up the word sheker, which means lie, you'll find that this word appears everywhere. In fact, you'll you'll find this word appearing here in in Jeremiah eight, and Jeremiah nine, and ten, and fourteen, and twenty three, and twenty seven, and twenty eight, twenty nine. I didn't count it, but this the word sheker. I'm not sure this is correct, but it's possible, it's very likely that the word Sheker appears in the book of Jeremiah probably more frequently than any other book, with the exception of the book of Psalms. What is Jeremiah speaking about? What is he saying? Who is he speaking about? Who are Jeremiah's opponents? Is Jeremiah saying that the Torah was changed? Is he saying that the sages, the true sages of Israel, are false? So the answer is, this is not the case. And the reason why people misconstrue Jeremiah 8 verse 8, and please, whoever you are, the caller, Please forgive me, I don't mean to offend you. Jeremiah is an enormous book. In fact, it's much larger than Isaiah and Ezekiel. You might wonder, how could that be? Jeremiah, after all, has fewer chapters than Isaiah, but his chapters are much, much longer. And Jeremiah is condemning those who are teaching something against the Torah. It's just the opposite. Jeremiah's opponents... He has a number of them, but the opponents in Jeremiah 7 and 8, and those two chapters are clipped together. If you just go through Jeremiah 7, what is is the context? What is Jeremiah speaking about? Who is Jeremiah speaking to? What is the problem? So, first, when did Jeremiah live? He lived at the very end of the first temple period. He was a contemporary of Tsephania. He was a contemporary of all the last Davidic kings, including including the very last of all the Davidic kings, who ultimately will be taken away to Babylon, and his, his family will be killed in front of his eyes, and then he'll be blinded. Jeremiah saw the worst. He saw the Babylonian Empire conquer Jerusalem 18 for 18 years, subjugated, and there was a very big problem. People believed that the Babylonian Empire would be would be incapable of destroying the first temple. And in fact, there were people who were preaching and teaching falsely that we could we could uh, go to war against Babylon and we can destroy Nebuchadnezzar. We can win. It it was an extremely attractive proposal. And these are called the Nevi'e Sheker. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 27, for example, everywhere, up and down, what you're going to find is over and over again, people who are spreading false teachings, people who are spreading false words. If you go to uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 27, verse 10, as an example, for they, for they are false prophets. And the purpose is that they, sh- and what will happen is, they will be, uh, um, they will be, in order to remove you, their purpose, their lies, the result will be is they will cause you to be banished or to be th- driven out of the land and you'll perish. Who are these false prophets? 
I mean, here Jeremiah is not even talking about a scribe now. Jeremiah is now telling us that our prophets that are, are false. We see the same thing. Look at Jeremiah 27. Al Tishmu al Divri Hanavim, don't listen to the words of the prophets. Is Jeremiah saying that we shouldn't listen to prophets? But it says it there. Al Tishmu al Divri Hanavim, don't listen to the words of the prophets. <laughs> A person would think maybe Jeremiah was against the prophets. Okay, so we've got to make the who say to you, plural, lamer, do not worship or do not serve the king of Babylon, because the prophets are false. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Is Jeremiah saying that we shouldn't listen to Isaiah? We shouldn't listen to Moses, God forbid? That we shouldn't listen to Ezekiel, God forbid? Is that what he's saying? So in Jeremiah 8.8, 8, he's saying, don't listen to scribes, that they're, they have a lying pen. Here, Jeremiah says, don't listen to the prophets. So imagine if I would take this out of context, I could, I could presume using the exact same approach to the text and say, yeah, Jeremiah is a very interesting character. He's actually warning us not to listen to prophets. So maybe we should, like, chas v'shom, God forbid, take the tire and throw it out the window, throw it in the garbage, because after all, Moses was a prophet. Don't listen to prophets. Now, how could somebody, how could such a, how could Jeremiah be saying this? If you read, if you read Jeremiah, in context, and you understood what is going on, all of this would make sense. Why is Jeremiah insisting that we should not listen to all these people? Don't listen to the prophets, um, the priests, the scribes. Don't listen to the prophets. Maybe that's what it means. Don't listen to the prophets. Maybe we should all buy Christopher Hitchens' book, uh, God Isn't Great. <laughs> that maybe that's what he's saying. So all of this is ripped out of context, my friends. People have no idea who Jeremiah is talking to. My beautiful friends, Kindlach, children of the Most High, who love Hashem. The mistake is that no people are not studying the book of Jeremiah. And with the help of Hashem, we will get there. Jeremiah can be a little difficult. Why? Because it's not in chronological order. But if you don't understand the book of Jeremiah, and you don't understand who were Jeremiah's chief opponents, who were his adversaries, you'll have no idea what's going on. You really might as well go home. And I, I say this to you. I say it to you with all the love of my heart. If you would dare apply, if you would dare apply this type of, of a study to any other book you've ever read in your life, where you take a book, imagine any, any book, and you would that has 52 chapters, and just skip to the eighth chapter and count eight verses, sentences, and read the eighth sentence, what's what are the chances that you would have any clue what's going on? Right. I, it, it, this continues, by the way, in, in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah is saying, don't listen to your dreams. You're causing yourself to dream. So, as you could see, sweethearts, that it, it's like smoking cigarettes. This is spiritually smoking cigarettes. You know, cigarette smoking has, a cigarette has some 250 carcinogens in it, poisons in it. And cigarette smoking causes, so let you read, smoking causes, causes everything. It causes heart disease, the number one killer. Number two, it causes cancer, the number two killer. Number three, it causes stroke. And you go all the way down, like, causes everything. Okay? It's the worst thing you could put in your body is cigarettes. And I'm using that it's exactly the same thing. If you read a passage out of context 
and you've not read the book, you are spiritually smoking cigarettes. You are, it's not that you're in danger, you're going to die. Because there are some people, for some reason that I don't know, that actually do smoke and actually die. To, they live to, you know, they die at 100 years old. Like George Burns, he smoked cigars and he lived to like 100 or something. Okay. But that will not happen to anyone who studies, who reads a passage in Jeremiah, does not read the whole book. And Jeremiah does require either a teacher, I mean, you really do need a teacher for Jeremiah. And you have to know the, the book of Kings very well. Uh, uh, less so, you, you need to know the book of Chronicles. But if you don't, you're you're a dead man. The reason I say that a teacher is very, very important with Jeremiah, or the Mephosh and the commentaries, is not that you need rather to tell you what to think. I'm not telling you that. It's just not in chronological order. And therefore, you can get confused. Okay? But it's so clear. This is what the 102nd, the 100 and whatever show we're doing together. I think it can be stated that every problem that people have in understanding a passage and then misconstrue what it's saying can be traced back to the, the reading out of context. Always. The, the, it might be that Books have mistranslated words. It might, there may be other things, but in all cases, people are are not familiar with the chapter. They're not familiar with going on, what Jeremiah's talking. And I'm giving, I'm saying it. I feel strongly about this because I'm trying to save you. I don't want you to drown. I really don't. You need to know that this is poison. You cannot understand scripture. You will go astray if you don't know Jeremiah. I mean, you can have a teacher and you can study the commentaries who are all they're doing is just guiding you and saying, look, they're putting everything together for you. And I'm going to try, I'm going to do that with you in a moment. I, um, I had a member of my congregation who spent Shabbos with me, and after Shabbos, he was talking to me about uh, his dad, and that his dad isn't feeling so well, hasn't been doing so well. And he told me that his father, who was a young man who was born in 1955, he's 62 years old, I believe, something like that, right? He told me that his father's had three strokes already, he's very worried about him. And right away I asked him, did, you know, was your father a smoker? And he looked down and said, yeah. Unfortunately, here in Indonesia, the, the smoke, about 70% of the population smokes. It's about the reverse of the United States where roughly 30% smoke and 70% don't. Here about 70% do and 30% don't. It's really unfortunate. Reto, I mean, I, I wasn't sure, but a young, relatively young man who has strokes all over the place, I asked him, do your dad smoke? And he said, yeah, he, he was smoking for quite a while. You know, his life. It's adult life. It's okay. Now, I'd say, why do I say it to you? Because I don't care about you. Why do I say it? Because I want to. I say it, I beg you, please, please, please study scripture. If you don't, there's something going to come over to you at a passage, and you're going to be lost. And you'll, you'll think, imagine I'll say to you, Jeremiah was against, um, were opposed uh, to listening to prophets. Imagine I would tell you that. Prophets are false. I have an open proof, Jeremiah 27, verse 14. Don't listen to prophets. <laughs> so... <clears throat> All right, let's talk about what's going on here, okay? So deep breath, let's study a little bit about what's happening. In the uh, 19 years before the first temple was destroyed, the Babylonian Empire emerged. The king was Nebuchadnezzar. A year after he became king, he, he 
enter Jerusalem. When I say entered, I don't mean entered as in uh, entered like the invited guest, but he, he came in and conquered Jerusalem. It means 18 years before the first temple was destroyed, Jerusalem and the land, the heirs of Israel, the Holy Land, became a vassal state above them. It was the Jewish state was not, was no longer an independent country. Do you understand that? Now, what do you think people were saying? People were saying, we have to fight back. What would you say? What would you do if you're an American and the Soviets, I remember as I was a kid, there were books and movies like this, that the Soviets won a war, they had a movie called America, spelled with a K, what would you do? So what happened was that the Jews in the land of Israel were being told by fake prophets, false prophets, People said, God told me we should fight back against Babylon. I remember years ago when I used to teach an advanced class in the book of Jeremiah. I used to teach students in the United States, uh, honors class, smart kids. And I asked them, what would you do? People, these the opponents of Jeremiah were all Jews. Jeremiah... I, Jeremiah wasn't dealing with, Jeremiah was not castigating Gentiles. In fact, most of the prophets did not. They were dealing with the Jews. And the other were Jews who misapprehended what was in store for them. They didn't realize that the temple was going to be destroyed and the temple could not save them. They were being told by people who claimed that God spoke to them that we can fight against Babylon. And Jeremiah is saying, God isn't with you. Do not oppose this, do not oppose this occupation of the Babylonian Empire in the land of Israel. Do not fight them. God is not with you because of your sins. Repent. And the people were being told, no. We don't need to have nothing to worry about. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7, by the way. In Jeremiah chapter 7, it opens it up. People are going, what are you, crazy? <laughs> we got the blood. Hmm. Jeremiah 7, the people are going, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. We've got the temple. And who built that temple? King Solomon, a prophet, a king, a great man of God author of three books in the Bible. The people, this, the first temple stood for 410 years. Four, you know what four centuries is? You know what four centuries is in the ancient world? That was forever. You're going to destroy the Babylonians are, are going to be able to defeat us? We have the temple. We have the blood. We've got the sacrifice. We're covered in the blood. If you keep reading Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah tells, smashes into them, you idiots. You think the blood's going to save you. Incidentally, this is why this text is holy today as it was then. Why is it important to us today? Because today you have still have people standing on the street corners, passing out pamphlets on the corner of 5th Avenue and 47th Street in the Diamond District, telling folks who walk through, who walk across this large avenue that you need to be covered in the blood. And Jeremiah says, who even told you when you went out of Egypt that you should, that you should, be, that you should be bringing sacrifices and all these zvachim? No, take your sacrifice energy and eat flesh. You're wasting your time. God is not interested in this. The blood can't save you. The altar can't save you. The temple can't save you. You fools. You have to repent and turn back to God. And don't you dare think that you're going to be able to you're going to be able to launch a counteroffensive against the Babylon Empire. God is not with you. In fact, Jeremiah says, Herzuchtsu, listen carefully. I speak Yiddish for those my Saudi Arabian listeners. Help me through this. So in Jeremiah 25, verse 12, he even says, You don't need to do this. 
Do you know why? The Babylonian Empire is only going to last for 70 years. That's it. 70 years. So if you just shut up, stay put, and just turn back to God, it'll be fine. You should know, incidentally, the Jeremiah's preaching against false scribes. They didn't change the Torah. They were writing out prophecies and handing them out and saying, yeah, listen. And if you read Jeremiah 7 and 8, Jeremiah is saying, stop listening to these people. Stop, stop listening to this kind of advice. This is what will lead you astray. So... <clears throat> There's nothing, so, okay, so first let's understand what, what's happening here. I beg you, please read it in context. I, 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 let me be, say this. I, I would l like it if you like me. Who doesn't want to be liked? Maybe you've been studying with me for a long time and checking every single thing I've told you, and you found out, that, hey, he, what he's saying is actually that's exactly what it says. I want you to stop trusting me. Uh, obviously, I you wouldn't be watching the show if you, you thought. I, I want you to get into the text because this is how you'll get in trouble. Jeremiah 7 and 8 is all about stop believing what they are telling you, that the temple will save you, it won't save you. The blood will save you, it will not save you. I defy you to read the first 22 chapters, 22 passages of Jeremiah 7. That's the whole Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 8. Is stop trusting all the stupid advice you're getting. It's turn back to God. That's the only way that you will be saved from Bovell, the only way, and incidentally, I'm not going to go into because we're going to be so sidetracked that the show will take 42 hours. But the speech that Jeremiah gave in Jeremiah 7 and 8 almost got Jeremiah killed. He was that close to being put to death. The only thing is that when they were about to kill him, they were reminded of another prophet who lived many, many years earlier who gave the same prophecy, oh boy, watch this. So, therefore, if you read Jeremiah out of context, you'll say, I'll say, oh yeah, you're not supposed to listen to prophets. It says, don't listen to the prophets. <laughs> it says they're liars. By the way, the word kishekerheim neviim lochem says that the prophets are liars. Is Jeremiah, I'm asking you a question. Now, imagine I would go, you, you shouldn't listen to prophets. Take your Bible and throw it in the garbage, because Jeremiah is telling us that prophets are liars. You'll go, wait, that doesn't make sense. Well, that's exactly the same thing when he says these scribes are liars. They're all doing the same thing. They are giving you false advice and encouraging you to defy Babylon, to rebel against Babylon. In fact, if you go to Jeremiah 29, verse 8 and 9, Jeremiah, they were Jews who were going, the Lord spoke to me, I had a dream. I'm not kidding. Jeremiah says, stop listening to your dreams. The people say, they're coming to me in my dreams. Could you, did, you ever hear, did you ever hear something like that before in your life? People say, oh, oh, the Lord came to me in a dream. The Lord, I had... Jeremiah says, you are the one who are causing yourself to have these dreams. Stop it. So, so let's now clarify what's happening here. Jeremiah, is his opponents are people who are Jewish, who had a, a yarmulke on their head, meaning they look completely orthodox, they ate completely kosher, and they were nationalists. We're going to fight the enemies, those who conquered us. And Jeremiah says, this is not, the he doesn't say these words, but I'm going to, we're not here in a situation of Joshua, where God is on your side. Well, God does say to Moses of blessed memory, and then in Joshua chapter 1, Chazak ve'ematz, God is with you. God is not with you now. This is a very different situation. And the rituals will not save you because all of the rituals, the mitzvahs, the commandments only work if they are coupled together with a social justice. 
Jeremiah for opposing these false prophets and these false scribes, these liars who claimed to be wise and said, the, the Torah is with us. He was thrown into quicksand and a black save, slave dragged him out, pulled him out of the pit. I'm not selling anything, but because I'm going on a tour, it's already all, I think, all sold out. But actually, I'll show you, I show my, my uh, uh, people who come on tour where the, uh, where that was, it's where, where the city of David is. In fact, there'll be another one in April. So therefore, if you don't know the context of thing, Jeremiah is saying that scribes falsify the Torah. No, Jeremiah is saying, you liars, shakronim. Sheker means false. You liars. You claim that the we are wise because the Torah is with you. You're a bunch of liars. But if you don't know the context, you'll think that there are a bunch of scribes. Now, one other point I should say about the word scribe, okay? The word scribe to us in the 21st century sounds like really, ooh, that means that it must be the people who write the Torah because who are scribes today in the 21st century? Nobody copies books by hand, except people, seifrim, which means scribes, who are writing Torah scrolls. But in the ancient world, in the days of Jeremiah, who lived two and a half thousand years ago, there was no movable printing press. You didn't have the, the good <laughs> the printing press that invented 500 years ago. Any person who, if you wanted to, uh, pass out a tract if you wanted to co convey something in right that is in written form you had to write it someone is if you wanted any book if you wanted uh, let's think of a book that that was around the days of jeremiah if you wanted aesop's fables which date back as early as Jer the book of Jeremiah, Lahabdo, but it, was, it goes back that far. If you wanted Aesop's fables, you needed to hire a scribe to write it for you, and you probably would have it written on, on probably on vellum, something very, very well, you know, something that would last a very long time. So that's what's going on here. This has nothing to do with the Christian Bible. As it turns out, it's so now that you got it, okay. What what you can do, what you can do is read the book of Jeremiah. What you might want to do immediately, just to make sure that what I'm telling you is accurate, is you may want to look up the word lie. Just I didn't do it, okay? So I'm not doing it now, but if you put the word lie or false in a search, because they're online, they're all over the place see where it comes up all over Jeremiah and see who are always lying. And it's not the idol worshippers who are lying. It's prophets and scribes. You mean prophets and scribes? You write the terror, they're writing a false story? No. You think prophets, God is speaking to them? They're not. They're false prophets. And here's the problem. I just want to end with this little piece here before we go into the Christian Bible briefly. The great tragedy was, of course, there were pious Jews that lived during the time of Yermio. Of course, there were. But unfortunately, <laughs> they were a remnant of a remnant. The majority of them were had fallen away. It wasn't they fallen away that they weren't eating kosher. It wasn't they fell away that they were going to Las Vegas and were sitting at a crap table. They were ultra-nationalists who thought that they could fight back Babylon. And Jeremiah is saying, I'm telling you, I am the one, who I'm t I am telling you the truth. And these guys who are claimed to be scribes and these guys who are claimed to be prophets are liars. They are, they, what they have is not from God. Don't follow them. And the tragedy is that the Jews who didn't believe Jeremiah, how did Jeremiah this is the tragedy. When you think about the dirge of Jeremiah, when you think about was Rembrandt's painting of Jeremiah, he, he, he so well conveys the agony of Jeremiah. The agony of Jeremiah was um, uh, manifold, was, was, uh, was on, on multiple levels. But when did the, 
the nation understand that Jeremiah was a true prophet and all these other scribes and prophets were a bunch of fakers and, and their advice was false. When the first temple was destroyed, then they went, now we got it. But it was too late. That means Jeremiah did not want to be vindicated. He didn't want to see the first temple destroyed, but it was destroyed. And then everyone, oh, yeah, yeah, Yemiyahu Hanavi HaKadosh V'Ator, this holy man of God, was right along, and all these fakers and phonies who were certainly looked like religious Jews, you can be sure of that, they were all false. That, that's the tragedy. And the tragedy goes on, we're not going to go into it, but the tragedy continues that Nebuchadnezzar was not an anti-Semite in the classical sense, because Nebuchadnezzar was saying, if you just guys just accept the fact that you're a vassal state, pay your taxes, pay your, you know, fine, just don't rebel. Okay, Haman was an anti-Semite. Nebuchadnezzar is not an anti was not a Jew hater in a classical sense. It was now a new empire. Babylon is here. As far as Nebuchadnezzar was concerned, Babylon's going nowhere. As far as the God of Israel is going, is you're going to be gone in 70 years. In fact, Isaiah prophesizes, going back to Isaiah chapter 14, that Babylon will be gone, and it will be the kings of Babylon who thought they were the morning star, of, like the planet Venus, but would disappear from the sky when the light would finally come. Hey, so, and what happens is ultimately on the ninth day of Av, on the on the ninth day of the fifth month, the temple is destroyed. Uh, um, Yirmiyo was vindicated. Nebuchadnezzar actually allows some Jews to remain in the land of Israel uh, under the leadership of a man named um, Gedalia ben Achiko, who was a very special person. Nebuchadnezzar said, go, go ahead, cultivate the land. And unfortunately, he was assassinated on Rosh Hashanah. Unbelievable. That means in the on the ninth day of the fifth month, the first temple was destroyed. Destroyed. Solomon's temple destroyed. And that's and already on the first day of the seventh month, they they assassinate the leader who is like a governor who is put in charge over a very small group of Jews who remain there. Okay, so that's that's the answer. Now, uh, I, I say it to you from my heart. You can either live um, in darkness, just tapping the walls, trying to find, you can do that, or you can turn the lights on. And there's only one way to turn the lights, and that is to immerse yourself in Tyre, to study the book of Jeremiah, just read it in context. That's all you need to do. Because I, I ain't, I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm not, I'm not a fancy guy. I'm not a fancy rabbi. All I've done was just tell you what the text is talking about if you read it in context. Okay? Mm, right, right. I love you guys, but you got to do that. And you're not doing that. And I don't get it. I really don't get it. I don't get why people who believe that the Bible is the Word of God and they just don't think that it's important enough to read from beginning to end. Really, it shocks me. It really, it stuns me that people will read novels, they'll read idiotic books from beginning to end. They'll read Harry Potter, and they don't read a letter given to you by God. Mm -hmm. Have you lost your mind? Okay, let's just, so that's the answer now. I don't, I mean, when it kind of, so therefore the word scribe, of course, scribe just means someone who writes something. You could have a, a scribe who writes something good, a scribe who writes something bad. You could have a false prophet, you could have a true prophet. Like Deuteronomy 13 has a false prophet. But Moses was a true prophet uh, of blessed memory. So the word, it's the context, it's what's going on. Now, I mean, technically speaking, I don't really want to, I'll do it. I'll, I'll give this three minutes, two minutes. And that is, in the Christian Bible, as it turns out, we are told by the writers that the information that the Pharisees, Pharisee is just an, an arcane word. 
that the Orthodox Jews really just just, just interchange it. Okay, Pharisees are Purushim. That's all they were. Purushim. This is the name given to them. They were people who, who held themselves separate. Okay, they we are told by the writers of the Christian Bible, who believe me, were not in love with Jews. And they admitted, conceded that the Pharisees and scribes sit in Moses' seat. And the fact, and therefore anything they tell you must follow. Do as they say, but don't do as they do. So you see, now, and that's Matthew 23, 1 and 2. And, Ma and Matthew 23 is not a chapter that's pro-Jewish, because Matthew is going to, whoever wrote this book, Matthew is going to charge into a heat of, of, of have Jesus called the Pharisees, the worst things, hypocrites, vipers, everything, responsible for the blood of everyone from, from Abel all the way to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. They actually, Matthew gets the, guy, gets the guy wrong. But the information they're conveying is true. It's just they don't live by it. That's what is being conveyed and happens to be conveyed in Matthew. So, this is, and, and in fact, if you look in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, I'm, I'm just saying this is not really relevant. And I'm only, I feel like in some way I'm defiling. I don't mean to be hateful. If you're a Christian, I apologize. But, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say it because it needs to be said. The, the teaching, the teaching, the content of what it was conveyed by the Pharisees and scribes, meaning the religious Jews, has always been the standard of truth in the Christian Bible. In fact, in Matthew 5, 17, 18, 19, where Jesus says, don't think that I came to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law, and so on, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, so you can't enter the kingdom. So that means that what we are told in the Sermon of the Mount. Did Jesus really make this speech on a mountain somewhere? Well, for some reason, Luke didn't think it was important to mention about this mountain speech. And he's in a plane and it's not whatever. But just forget all that. But it's clear that whoever wrote the book of Matthew is saying that the standard of observance that you'll find among the Pharisees is the, is the highest standard. So, it is not the same as Jeremiah. But anyways, it's not relevant really, because now that you know what Jeremiah is about, you'll realize that this is a complete, it's a completely bogus analogy. You have to read it in context. And the truth is that I have never in my life met the person who quoted me Jeremiah 8, verse 8, who had any clue of what that chapter is talking about, had no idea. No idea what he's talking about. Right. Who is he talking to? What happened? Did Jeremiah just throwing a fit? And by the way, keep reading chapter 8, verse 10. I mean, who are these liars and liars and liars all over the place? And that's the answer to the question. So, my beautiful friends, time has come because the, the, the rooster is already, um, the rooster is already howling. The light is soon coming. It's time now to turn back to Scripture. Time to the Higisa by Yevim Belayla. It's time to immerse yourself entire day and night. This will bring you closer to Hashem. No other way. This will be, bring the coming of the true Mashiach from Hebrew Menu. Thank you so much for asking that question. I mean, I mean, very good. Okay, we'll take this next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where you calling from? Hi. Hey. Rabbi Tovia and William, this is Sean in Montana. How you guys doing? Hey Sean, welcome back. How are you? I'm I'm good. Long long time no speak. <laughs> What's the question for Rabbi today? Well, um, yeah. So some people kind of know my background, but ultimately to get straight to the point, a lot of times when I've um, had revelation and some of the stuff that Tovia has brought up, and I try to talk to family, friends, and people who are surrounding me. We're all Christians. Uh, so a couple examples, when I talk about Matthew chapter 2, referring, you know, verses, I think it's 13 through 15, where out of Egypt I call my son. Mm, right. And I think you go back to Hosea, and you can see specifically that the son they're referring to is Israel, not Jesus himself, and or Numbers 23, 19, or 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. What I'm finding is, is I... I um, 
get an aggressive response. I get a, like I punch them or stab them in the back or stab them. I'm a heretic. So my question, my question is, is there a verse specifically, if someone actually you're speaking with and you have that feeling that they might actually be open to listen to, is there a verse out there that kind of opens their eyes to study that might not be so offensive? I feel like, I mean, again, these verses are plain in our text and we should take them into consideration, but when I bring it up in context, I always get negative responses. So my question, again, is what verse would Tovia go to, maybe someone to kind of soften their heart and actually get them to study some of this stuff and not put up a brick wall as soon as I bring a verse like that up to them? Yeah, great question. So what would be your first choice of the least aggressive, the least offensive thing to present to someone who is trying to engage in dialogue with you about your faith? Sean, good. First thing, all right, thank you, Sean. Okay, take care, brother. Thanks for calling in. Yeah. Okay, good deal. Okay, Rabbi, take it away. The first thing I, I, okay, let me, like, really answer your question first directly. This is what really not to do. Uh, don't get all upset. Like, <laughs> don't throw attention. <laughs> right. I'm kidding. Um, what you don't want to do is is start attacking the Christian Bible and showing how uh, the New Testament contradicts itself. You don't want to do that. It, it's not that that isn't important. It's very significant because it goes to the issue of errancy. And when I and here's what you really, really, really don't want to do is you don't want to be picky yoon. This is what you don't want to do. Meaning you don't want to go, oh, it says in Acts seven that there were seventy five people went down to Egypt. Stephen is speaking. Uh where were the patriarchs buried? Were they buried in Shechem, as Acts says, as Stephen says in the book of Acts? Or were they buried in Hebron, where they actually were buried? It, that stuff is just really offensive to Christians. Okay, you don't want you don't want to do that. That's what you don't want. You don't want to be aggressive because you have to understand that Christians really, 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 really love Jesus. They really do. Took me a long time to figure this out. Uh, Because normally, the way way I think people um, address people's beliefs and when they want to convince somebody, they think they're dealing like with a stock. Like the guy just, you know, bought a stock and your friend said, look at the stock. You know, look at the stock that I just got. I just got this portfolio, whatever, okay? I just bought all these shares of Apple, okay? Now, you happen to know that, you know, that, or or Samsung, but you happen to know that the Samsung Note 7 just blew up on an airplane, on a Southwest airplane, okay? Obviously, I'm dialing back a year ago. You happen to know that Samsung's premier smartphone is blowing up on fire all over the place. And you say, you need to sell that stock immediately because it's going gonna, it's gonna to go down. Okay? You're on a plane, a United Airlines, fl- a United Airlines flight, and you're sitting, you're sitting there and watching a man getting dragged out of his seat and blood is on his face because he's bumped from a plane and he refuses to get off because he's a doctor who has to treat patients. And as he's being dragged down the aisle, pulled out or down the aisle of the United States, you, 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 you right away call your friend and say, sell all your, your stock in United or short it out. Okay, so a person go why? And you say because this just happened and it's being filmed by everyone. It's the video is going to be up shortly, and United's um, the stock is going to nosedive. Okay, so a person go really? Thank you so much. Click them. The the reason why that works is because when people buy stocks, they don't care about the company; they just care about the outcome. There's no emotional attachment to it. 
Get the point? So therefore, if you happen to know that United stock is about to nosedive because of an incident on a, on a domestic flight in the United States, or because of a, a, a poorly designed battery in, in the flagship smartphone of Samsung, people go, fine, I'll sell it, I'll short it. I don't care. Why? Because they're not a they're not married to it. They just want to make money. Okay? Okay. But that's how people tr treat Christians, and you got to stop doing that. Because they Christians really, really love Jesus. You need to be very careful. Really careful. So if you start by just going, it means if you take the offense, uh, uh, if you like, if you treat this like a chess game and you're playing the white pieces, and you start attacking the Christian Bible, you're going to find that you're going to find that you're going to lose your audience immediately. They they just defend it. They really 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 love Jesus. If you ask Christians why do you believe in Jesus, I I, I promise you, I mean why do you believe in Jesus? They can say because I love him and he died for my sins. If you don't believe me, just stand outside of a Southern Baptist church and as people are going in on Sunday morning, ask him, why are you Christian? Because Jesus loves me and I love him. He died for my sins and I want to go to heaven. You're not going to hear, you know, some fancy theology from Paul and, and so on. That's not what you're going to hear, okay? You need to know that. And therefore, you have to deal with it very carefully. So what you need to do is, first of all, learn to listen. There is not this verse that is a, there isn't this verse that's, you know, not so hard, not so aggressive. It's not there. Um, what you need to do is to listen very carefully to why this person believes in Jesus. And one other point. It's very important to understand why Judaism does not accept the Christian Messiah. I need to make this point. And you're going, well, I know why he didn't. The reason is, is not because the Trinity doesn't make sense. Maybe there are mysteries we don't know. It doesn't, it's, the reason is not because of vicarious atonement, the notion that an innocent person could die for the sins of the wicked is unjust. The reason is, is because Tanakh says that these ideas that Christ, it doesn't that these ideas that Christianity is advancing are opposed by the prophets of Israel. There is nothing remotely resembling Christianity when you read Tanakh. That's the reason. The reason is because to, the teachings of the church are not consistent with Tanakh, and that is why we reject them. Period. End. So here's what you need to do. You need to not raise, um, uh, you alluded to um, Matthew's fulfillment citations. Uh, I quote Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, where, um, uh, where Joseph is told in a dream that Herod is seeking to uh, kill the young child, and mm, Joseph gathers up, uh, Mary and Jesus, and they make their way down to Egypt to escape Herod, and they are there until the death of Herod. That am I fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And then you go to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and what does it say? If you look it up, <clears throat> you realize that Matthew completely misquoted this text, and Matthew actually only quoted the end of Hosea 11, 1, where it says, um, out of Egypt I might call my son. But the, ch the, verse, the passage begins with, when Israel, Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So Matthew surgically removed the last part of the passage. He jettisoned the, the first part of the passage, which tells us the context. And Matthew completely misapplied this, and he does this to he does this to every single so-called fulfillment citation. But what I don't I don't want you to do that. Please don't do that. Unless you're speaking to a Christian 
And the Christian says, this is why I believe in Jesus, because of Matthew chapter 2, 13 through 15. And I see that that's a fulfillment of Hosea 11, 1. So here's what I want you to do. I, I just, just be on the, play the defense, not the offense. Because if you come in with an agenda and say, this is why I think you shouldn't believe in Jesus, it's just so offensive. It's going to throw people off. Incidentally, that's why this is so obvious to me. That this is the reason why the structure of our shows is that I don't get up and make a speech for two hours while I will hear, but rather I take phone calls from callers because I don't want to get aggressive. I want to be, in a sense, on the defense, I mean, I want to respond to these pressing questions that callers are raising. And then respond to it. So what you need to do is you need to not feel like, okay, I'm going to just rip this person and forget that. And forget about the internal contradiction in the New Testament. Uh, what you need to do is you need to ask the person, why, why do you believe in Jesus? Let them witness to you and listen and don't interrupt them. Let them talk their heart out, okay? And you don't have to correct them on every little thing. You don't. I'm telling you, really. You have to wait until they explain to you what is meaningful to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, and then what you do is when they have disclosed why they feel that the Christian religion uh, is moving to them, and they tell you, respond to that. Don't come up with your own stuff. That's that's where everyone's mistake is. Be very patient. God has given you two ears and one mouth. Try to maintain that ratio. <laughs> listen True. twice as much as you speak. I listen to someone uh, for a very long time, quietly. I mean, when I'm just speaking to someone who's a Christian. Take your time. Let them tell you what their criteria is of what is important to them. And then answer them step by step and say, okay, let's take a look. I mean, Christians are asking important questions and they deserve answers. Um, uh, the vast majority of Christians I encounter are very grateful that I'm responding to their questions, and a few of them act foolishly by saying, you have no right doing this, and you're an anti-missionary, and you're anti g Well, what are we supposed to do? You just throw, like, just shoot spiritual missiles at us, and we're supposed to stand there? So what you, what you need to do is not ask me, what's the magic bullet? There isn't. What you need to do is respect the person who's um, who's preaching or witnessing to you in that, let them convey to you what's really meaningful to them. Incidentally, this is why missionaries mess up all the time. Missionaries mess up very frequently because they got these pamphlets and they've got these speeches and they, they put people off. They turn generally turn people off. People become Christians because they're turned on by the life of, of the way Christians live their life. They become Mormons because they like the stability that the latter that the Church of the Latter Day Saints provides for them. There's a whole wide range of reasons. You got to stop and you got to listen. So there isn't a magic bullet. The magic bullet is listen carefully and respond. Just respond in the Bible. Don't go. Oh, this is a big. Just take your time and say, well, let's take a look at what the text actually says. Let's look at the context here. The, are these ideas, all religions are making the same truth claims. They're all stating that if you, if you follow my religion, you're going to go to heaven, and if you don't, you're going to go to hell. They all do that, okay? Hey, all the, all the successful ones do that. Okay? So they're all making this very serious claim. The question is, how do you know which is true if they're all making this same claim? 
because everybody's scared to die because people don't know what's going to happen after you die and we're all unlike every other creature in this on this earth cats do not know they're going to die we do and this is very traumatic for us it really is something that shocks us because we know that one day we're going to die that is amazing your dog does not know he's going to die he doesn't understand that we do we can prepare for the future as i know you love your dog but your dog can't cannot does not have the 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 intellectual cognitive requisite necessary to say next tuesday i'm going to be doing this and i'm going to die one day so they can't they can't do it just they're not wired that way we are so because of our awareness of death these things are really important and therefore if the criteria is that I don't want to go to hell, or a person also may not just fear punishment, a person may love God and want to serve him. So if the person discovers that although they're given a promise of fantastic things, eternal life and so on, but in fact it's a counterfeit, and people don't want to counterfeit. They want to make sure that when they get to the concert and they're about to enter and the usher takes out the flashlight and looks at it and then puts it under the ultraviolet light to make sure that it's, a, it, it's not a fake. They want to be sure that the usher says, go right in. They don't want to be told this is a fake ticket. That's the key. Okay? Remember, People who hold fake for counterfeit tickets and people who hold authentic tickets all waiting in line to get into the concert hall while they're waiting in line are just as ecstatic. Right. And are the, 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 the question is, what is the result? Are you really going to go to heaven? Is this ticket going to pass the test? And the answer has to be, has the default baseline has to be Tanakh, has to be. Why? Because all Christians believe that Tanakh is the word of God. Because Abrahamic religions believe that Moses, a blessed memory, was a great prophet who spoke to God face to face, received every word, every letter directly from Hashem. And that's what you have to do. You have to do it carefully, and there is the magic bowl, and stop with the internal contradiction of the New Testament, unless the person says that the New, and if the person says to you, now, I just want to make this clear, this is really important, says, look, I believe in the New Testament because it's written by eyewitnesses, okay? That Matthew was an eyewitness, Mark was an eyewitness, uh, Luke was an eyewitness, or a companion to an eyewitness, and John was an eyewitness, a disciple whom Jesus loved. If they're saying that's the criteria, what is important to them is, and then they go on to say that not that the disciples willingly died for what they believed, and liars don't make good martyrs, then you can respond and ask the question, well, on what basis uh, do you state that a disciple of Jesus wrote the book of Matthew? Well, they'll say, well, it says so. St. Matthew, it says it right on top. It, well, it's actually, that's not in the manuscript. And that ascription is from the late second century. Really? You see, because they, that's their point, not yours. Don't bring it up unless, unless they do it. If Mark, if Luke was at, at a separate sources, why is Luke copying the entire book of Mark? Virtually all of it. But then, then it becomes relevant, then it becomes important, because there's an apostolic authority being claimed. Okay? And the Christians are saying, this is why we trust it. And then when they go, well, all the disciples willingly died and died, and Peter was hung upside down, and Paul's head was chopped up and bounced three times, you might want to ask them, what is your source for this? What is your source that any disciple died for what they believed? Oh, they'll say it's in the New Testament. Peter was crucified upside down to, um, in Rome. So really, please tell me, where does it say that? Uh, what do you mean? It doesn't say it? No. The book of, do you think 
Again, this is a response to that. If that's their point, you say, do you think the book of Acts that is written, let's say, in the year 80, whatever, do you really think that the author of the book of Acts, who is devoted really to Paul, the, the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles. It really should be called the Acts of Paul. Yeah. Do you think that the author of the book of Acts, that, that, do you think that Paul gave his life for his faith, his head was chopped off? Forget that it bounced three times and it made three springs. You can go see it in Rome today. They got a church built with, with three tree stumps. Forget all that stuff. But Let's just forget that stuff. Do you think that Acts would end that Paul is free and did not think that Paul's martyrdom was important enough to the author of Acts? The author of Acts is Luke. Luke is very interested in telling you how to die. That's really important to the book of Acts. So it isn't there. This is all later Catholic tradition. So what I'm saying to you is if a person says that the uh, I'm convinced by the authority of the writers of the Christian Bible, then it's fair, then slowly and carefully say, well, how do you, how do you know Matthew wrote Matthew? It isn't there. Um, really, I didn't know that. Uh, how do you know Peter was crucified upside down? That's a, you know, these are all Catholic traditions that everybody died. The only guy who doesn't die that they, the church has to keep alive is John, the writer of the book of John, who almost gets killed but somehow manages not to. Why? Because the book of John we know is written about 1995, and if John was a disciple, means he was a full-blown adult in the year 30, that in the year 90 he was really old. So they got to keep him around. So this is all reverse-engineered stories. So so that's what you have to keep in mind. That, but only if somebody raises it. Now, I get heat. I get people go, you don't know who wrote the book of Samuel. People say to me, who's the author of the book of Samuel? Oh, you can't tell me. It doesn't say in the book of Samuel who wrote it. Okay. I, just, I need to say this because I get, I get 20 emails a day on this point. Okay. Now, there is this, we have Talmud, Bovabasur 15, that tells us the authors of, of Tanakh. I want to set that aside because Christians don't believe in it. This is the point, and listen, and listen carefully. We are not saying that we believe in the book of Samuel because Samuel wrote it. That means we're not claiming that the authority of the book of Samuel is based on the author. But the Christians are saying that. And therefore, when it comes to Samuel, it's not relevant to us who wrote it. As it turned out, it was written by multiple authors, because Samuel wrote some of it, but he died already in 1 Samuel. So it was written by God and Natan. It doesn't make a difference who wrote it. The point is that it is not relevant to us who wrote the book of Samuel. And therefore, it is it is dishonest to say, well, you don't know who wrote Samuel, you don't know who wrote Kings. We, of course, we have, Jews have our tradition, that as who wrote Chronicles, so on and so forth. But let's just say you don't believe in Talmud, you don't believe in Jewish tradition. Fine! But it, I am not saying that you should trust Tanakh because the author was an eyewitness. But Christians, therefore, it's not relevant who wrote it, and it's not relevant that it's written anonymously. Okay? It's not relevant. But Christians are saying, and believe me, they're saying this, that the reason we trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is because they were written by eyewitnesses and they were written by disciples or the companion disciples, and they were there, they saw it, and that's why we trust them. Very true. And if you don't know that, trust, believe me, that is the that was how the church decided who wrote what or how the, why these descriptions, why was Matthew called Matthew? The reason is because it wasn't, why didn't they just say it was written by Tony? Why was it written by Christina? Why why was it written by Bob? Well, the reason is because no one would care. Mm -hmm. If it's if, if it said there, it, the, this thing was written by a, a Colin Powell, who grew up in Brooklyn, then people wouldn't care. 
The key is it had it was written by Matthew. Oh, Matthew, a disciple? Fine. As it turns out, in the book of Matthew, the writer never says Matthew, it means the narrator, never says Jesus came over to me and says this. He never does that. So if a Christian says, this is very important, and I've never addressed it, and I need to get it out. If a Christian says that the reason I believe in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is because of the authority of those who wrote it, namely, that they had apostolic authority, then it becomes very relevant. We don't say that we trust the book of Samuel because of who wrote it. And therefore, it's not relevant. That's the key. You've made it a point, and that's what you have to do. Be very careful of what the Christian is raising and also have a lot of love for Hashem. That's another thing. Don't be angry like me. <laughs> <laughs> don't get all, don't throw a tantrum. That means be gentle, be calm. I'm on air and I, I get hit all day, so I let it, my steam off here. No, be just, just gently listen, answer step by step, go to the text, go to the originals, go to the sources. Don't also, don't appeal to authority. I don't think, I'm not sure, but I don't think you ever hear me quote a some Christian scholar or some Jewish scholar. You never, did you ever hear me quote Rashi or Maimonides? Mm. I don't think so. Did you ever hear me quote? I, I, it's very rare. Why? Because it's not relevant. They could be wrong. It's what does the text say? Watch what I'm doing. I'm not quoting, oh, it says this, says that. Yeah, if you'll ask me, so I'll tell you what they said. You know, so, so that's the key point. Listen, learn to listen. People don't know how to listen in relationships. That's why they get into trouble. Mm -hmm. People don't know how to listen in a conversation. And that's why they can't communicate. And that's why they're ineffective in presenting a meaningful case to someone who really is hungry for the truth. Thank you for your question. Awesome. All right, we'll move on to this next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi. Hello. Hello? Yes, you are live on Am air. Am I on the line? You are. You're on. Hello? Can you hear us? Yes. Hello? I'm going to hang up because he clearly I can't. Can hear, but no, no, don't, don't, don't hang up. Am, you are li this up. is a live call, and you are live on the air. Do you have a question for Rabbi? Right now, I'm live. Yes, you are live. Okay, okay. Okay, hi, my name is Max. I'm from Adelaide, South Australia. Max, welcome. And I have a question um, regarding who are the people of God? Like, uh, if uh, are all the sons of Adam uh, the, the children of God? Uh, are all the sons of Adam the people of God? Or who, who, who exactly are the people of God? Who are the sons of God? And who are the sons of Adam? Like, are there any sons that are not the sons of Adam, or is everyone the son of Adam? Don't and if everyone is the son of Adam, does that mean everyone is a children of God, a child of God? Um, that's my question. Okay, uh, don't don't hang up just yet, there. Max. Hang on the phone just a minute, okay? Uh, okay, Rabbi. Go ahead. Uh, do you do you want this, to cross this question? two points that have been conflated here? Mm -hmm. uh, are is every human being? A descendant of Adam. In fact, is every human being a descendant of the people that were introduced to in uh, specifically in Genesis chapter five? The answer is yes. Being a child of God in the way Tanakh means it, not in the Greek sense. That's something different. I mean, so are you asking me of people who are truly children of Hashem, not? Not in the sense that they're divine in any way. I, or are you asking me, is the entire human race descendants of a single couple, Odom and Chavo, Adam and Eve? Is, which is your question? Or are they both your question? Okay, that, 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 that's, that's my first question. And if that, if that premise is true, then aren't we all children of God? Aren't we all sons of God? Aren't we all... God's children, meaning B'nai children. Israel. If if that premise if that premise is true, are we all God's children? So why okay, make a so distinction between Jew and Gentile? I think he's why asking about uh, B'nai Israel. Is what it sounds like. I don't know. What do you think, okay. Rabbi? Okay. Well, thank okay. you for your question, and uh, Rabbi, we'll let you take this away. Is that the all right? Fine. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, the problem is that you using a, is that a problem? I know this really must be on your mind. Are we all children of God? So the question is, what, what is meant by that? So every person is created um, in B'Tselem Elikim. Every single person is creating the image of Hashem. I mean, literally, quite literally. Uh, Tyre says, in, um, when we are introduced, descendants of Odom Erishon, the Torah says, "Zeh seif betolus Adam, b'yom b'yom bro elokim Adam, b'demus elokim also oisoi." That God made Adam in in the image of God because God infused in him His breath, and we in turn are created. This was then conveyed over to the sense of Adam Rishon. Therefore, every single... Now, in Genesis 5, is important because already Cain is not there. What we find in Genesis 5 are those who would survive, not all, but those who would survive the flood would be among those we find in Genesis 5. So therefore, every human being has a neshama, has a soul has a, is creating the image of God. And we say the creating the image of God, be very careful. What? We don't mean an image that God has nose and he blows his nose. No. It means that we have inside of us a soul, a neshama, which is a part of God that is breathed into us. And we are in fact torn between that element of us our higher state and our lower state, meaning we also have a the nefesh of a behema because we are also created, like Adam, out of the clay of the earth, which means that we have all the desires and 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 longings and lusts and so on that every animal has, because animals were created out of the uh, out of the ground as well. But we have within us a, a part of God. And that's why there's this tension. Only mankind is created this way. In that we are both animal. You look at a dog, your dog, your cat. I get them. What do dogs want? They want to eat. They want to sleep. They want to have babies. They want to be loved. And they want their bellies tickled. I get that. And they want the food on the table, not the stinky stuff from the can. Okay, they don't want the, I mean, they want the good stuff. Okay. We all want that because we all created from that same material, but we have a higher order. What is our, and that's why incidentally, when God, the Almighty, blessed be his name, created men, he said, let us make men in our image because God now, unlike previous creations, God is now drawing upon all of this to form man from what has already been existed. The breath of God, the clay of the earth. Okay? Now, and therefore man is above all the angels. And man has free will. He's torn. And what is the role of a person uh, and, and that is to take the physical and raise it up to the spiritual. The most ecstatic vision, dream, that anyone ever had in Scripture was ya Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our father, all of HaShalom, of blessed memory, who saw a ladder that collected, connected earth to heaven. And therefore, what he wanted, he connected the two. And th that was a fantastic dream. What we do is when we eat, you make sure you're allowed to eat such a thing. Does that food belong to you or is it someone else's? Did you earn the money honestly? Do you make a blessing? Do you thank Hashem for the food or you just eat it and just gobble it down the way Esau did? He sat, he came, he sat, he ate the lentil soup. He got up and he left. If you look at the language in that passage, that the way Esau ate, he, 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 he took it, he, 
He took it, he ate, he got up and he <laughs> a gefres, like a behemi, he ate like an animal. Nothing. Or did he thank Hashem? Esav didn't. Abraham a blessed all of Hashem did. So the key is that in order for us to reach our potential of what God wants for us is not to be souls up there, completely detached, but to be here. To have good food, but make a blessing. To have a good a all good things, but say it's from Hashem. To raise the physical to spiritual. That's why Judaism is a very physical religion. On on on, on Rosh Hashanah on our holidays, we're eating all eating all delicious foods, we're making blessings, we recognize that God is king. We blow the trumpet, the shofar, announcing, coronating that God is king of kings, Lord of Lord, host of hosts, and so on. That's why Judaism is such a physical um, religion, like we're doing things, because what we're really doing is we're raising up the physical material world, raising up the spiritual. We're taking that behemoth, that animal, and we're then guarding it. We're not saying we're celibate and we're not, you know, we're just going to starve to death and, you know, no. Eat good stuff. Look at our Shabbos table in a Jewish home. The best food in the world. Abracha, we sing songs to Hashem, we recognize this food comes from Hashem and so on. Okay, now, so that you understand, so that's the point. But we all are children of, of Odom, and when you look at a person, you should know in some way that I cannot explain, um, you, you're you looking at Salam Kim. You're looking at someone created, there's nothing to do with being Jewish or not. Every human being is created with Salam Kim. Now, a person could reject that neshama and could connect to his behemoth, to his animal instincts, and go, I'm the one, I'm the person, I'm successful because I'm smart. So then you've, you've failed. Now, the term, the term being a, a child of Hashem in Tanakh, be very careful with this term, is, means that if a person is performing the will of God, then that person is called a, a son of God. It means he's a child of God because he's performing the work of Hashem on this earth. And Hashem is a father, but not in the Christological sense, but in the sense that HaKadosh Baruch, I mean, we say in Malachi, have we not one father? And in fact, the, when the Torah warns us in Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, not to engage in excessive mourning when chas from God forbid, someone dies, is Torah says, Bonum atem l'ashem l'keichem, you're children of, of God. Don't go crazy. Your mourning is very important. In Judaism, God forbid, the parent reaches 120, so you mourn the seven-day mourning and 30 and so on, but you don't rip your hair out of your head and start cutting your body up. You don't do that because there is a God who's the father of all of us. So you're, you're, you're going, you're denying everything. So therefore you're not allowed to engage in that kind of practice. So, or we find in 2 Samuel chapter 7 where the Almighty promises that, that he will be a father to King Solomon and he'll be to be a son, it does not mean that in the Greek sense, in the Greek sense, they were divine people. This is complete, the, the Greek, this is what Greek is. I mean, in the Greek sense, um, uh, emperors like Octavius, emperors like Vespasian, may he perish in hell, when they died, they became divine. And they, when they, when, when, when Octavius or Caesar Augustus, the stepson of, the adopted son of, of Julius Caesar, he was considered divine and a, a son of God. It meant he literally was a god in the sense that the son of a, of a giraffe is a giraffe. You understand? Now, the son of a giraffe is not equal to the father giraffe. Therefore, in, in the Greco-Roman mind, uh, Octavius, after he died, um, Tiberius, after he, uh, 
um, Vespasian, after he died, they don't believe they became equal to Z to Jupiter. No way, Jupiter was way way up there. So in the Greek in the Greek were mind, there was a whole tier of gods. I cover this extensively in an entire chapter of Volume One, where I explain I go through the history of the doctrine of the Trinity, its origins, and how Christianity converted to Rome rather than Rome converting to Christianity. And I go through this in great detail. So be very careful because we have to be not throw around the words, what is the son of God and so on. Very careful. And the term also sons of God can be used as those who represent, who are teaching what God is saying as in Exodus 21 and 22, where judges are, are, could be referred to that way. So be very careful, be very careful to really do Tanakh in order to understand it and in order to guard your life by it. You really have to immerse. That's why Joshua said to the people as they entered the land of Israel in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, he said, Pay very careful attention to this tire, Vihigisa Bayam Valila, and you should immerse in it um, day and night because this is the source of your wisdom and understanding. Conversely, if you don't study uh, tire, if you're not immersed in tire day and night, you will have no wisdom and no understanding. So and that's what what King Solomon tells us, Shema Bani in Proverbs, Musa Avicha, listen, my son, to the teachings and to the uh, to the teachings of your father, or the um, uh, Musa really means uh, castigation or correction. We'll use that's a good word to the correction of father. And do not abandon the tire of your mother. Your mother in a Jewish home, the woman is the Rabban Shal Yisrael. The woman is the one who teaches Tyra. The woman is the one who keeps the Jewish home together. That the woman is the real rabbi of the Jewish people. People get all excited. Oh, rabbis can only be men. <laughs> Nonsense. The rabbi of the Jewish people is a woman, and without the Jewish mother, the Jewish people would never be here. We would never even be redeemed from Egypt. The, and the Jewish home is the center of Jewish life. Remember, the word the, the word synagogue doesn't even appear in Tanakh. It's a Jewish home that's all over Jewish scriptures. She, in Proverbs 31, is the Tzayfiyah Halicha Isbesa, the woman of valor, is the one who is the, the person who is the Tzayfiyah, the Tzayfiyah means someone who's a who's in the watchtower, she guides the family. She's in charge of the spiritual direction of the family. Be very, very careful. That's what it means. But these are terms that are very flexible in our language because people have used the exact same words to mean a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. Be very careful. You have to have a lot of discernment, and that discernment can only come slaying scripture. Now, if you are just starting to study, and this is new to you, then you have to really find a teacher who will teach you who's trustworthy. You look things up. Make sure. I always say, look it up for yourself. Mm -hmm. I want people to look it up. Stop. But you do need a teacher if you're just walking into it. Because if you don't, then you're going to you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Right. But right. be careful. You don't going to go to Eskimos to <laughs> learn about the tire, okay? I mean, use your brains, okay? If you want to know about the tire, you don't go to the Eskimos. If you want to know how to make an igloo, go to the Eskimos. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you want to learn about the tire, go to the Jews. What yeah, do I tell you? Very true. If you want to know about, uh, you know, that's all. So in and, his uh, in his closing comment, just comment on this real quickly, um, his closing comment is that why is there, if we're all descendants from Adam, and we've all been created by God, why is there a need to distinguish a Jew versus a non-Jew? Oh, because uh, we told us, we told us in Exodus chapter 19, and that is that you need a guide in the world. You need a mamleches koyhanam v'goy kadosh, Torah says, v'atenti mamleches koyhanam v'goy kadosh. This is right for the Ten Commandments. Uh, let's set this up, by the way. Genesis is about God's search for a family 
who would have a unique mandate. That mandate would be to be a light to the nations. Okay? Not everybody would make it. Esau is out. Okay? Very important. Jacob is in. Okay? Now, that's what Genesis is. Genesis, I mean, think about this moment. Genesis is 50 chapters. Okay? 39 of those chapters, 39 of those chapters are devoted to Abraham and his descendants. That tells you something. What happened to everybody else? It's focusing. Once the nation has been formed, then the Torah says, this is your job. Your job is to be a kingdom priest. Now, if the Jews, it doesn't mean a priest, like a priest, the descendants of Aaron. It's a different. The word koihen means to serve in office, meaning to have a leadership position. It could even be a bad priest, meaning the priests of Baal were also called Kayan Ebal. The point is, the, you have to be careful how that word is even used. Believe me, people abuse this up and down. Well, it said there was a priest, there were priests. No idea. So they come, everything gets conflated. Because they're not familiar with the language. So the role of the Jewish people is to be a light to the world. How? Go out and hold crusades and inquisitions? No. Just keep Torah and the world's going to come and they're going to go by your light. Rise and shine. Kings will go by your light. Isaiah chapter 60. That's the role of the Jew. Isaiah 49. To be a light to the nations. That means we are here to facilitate the knowledge of Torah to the world. Now, do all Jews fulfill this mandate? The answer is no. The majest majority abandoned the message. They weren't interested. They weren't interested in carrying an eternal message. And therefore, they're lost among the nations. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, really, it's worth reading it. Torah is so, so, so good. So it tells us there that and look at Je Je uh, Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, that the covenant is extended only to those who love God and keep the Torah. Everybody else is gone. The Jews who became Christians 2,000 years ago, 1,800 years ago, 700 years ago, their grandchildren are gone. Peter's grandchildren are no longer here as Jews. They lost the covenant. Why? Because they followed other gods that their fathers did that's it. That was what happened to the Abionites, a very early sect of Christians who were Torah observant from what we know and didn't believe in the Trinity. They're gone because they believe that the, that Jesus died for their sins, period. And there's no, they're gone. The Abionites, they don't have grandchildren, the Abionites. They lost the covenant. The role of the Jew in this world is to keep the Torah, and by keeping the Torah, this is something we don't know how it works, but when the Jew keeps Torah, it, it flashes light all over the world and raises up the world. Conversely, if a Jew does not keep Torah, it brings the world down. And that's what causes Jew hatred. We really bring it on ourselves because if we sin, what happens? The nations of the world don't have a light from which to from which to learn. And what they do is they turn against God. And how do you go to war with God? You go to war with God by going to war with the children of Israel. And that's why Jews are punished more than others, because we when a Jew sins, it's not just that we sin, but we cause the world to sin. That's why if you look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2, actually stop from verse 1, it says, Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami, comfort you, comfort my people, declares the Lord. Why should, why should, why comfort? Does it say because Jesus, my son, died for your sins? No. It says because Jerusalem has taken from the Lord double for her iniquity. You got, you got twice as much as as your sins. Why double? It's not fair. It is fair because when the Jew sins, he takes away from the light that the world desperately needs. So we're not chosen. People think, oh, you Jews think you're chosen. You think you're better. No. I mean, if anything, the Jews suffered, suffered a heck of a lot, probably more than any other nation. Because when we sin, we we cause others to sin. Notice, I want to just this end point is if you notice that when Jews suffer, what do we suffer from? 
uh, we don't suffer from from the um, uh, the earthquakes that destroyed um, Haiti years ago and tsunami that hit Indonesia and Thailand and years ago. Generally speaking, Jews do not suffer natural disasters. I mean, there were Jews in, who were in Phuket who died on that horrible December 26th. But that's not what Jews suffer from. Take a look around you. What did you suffer from? We suffer from the nations of the world, from the Goyim, from the nations of the world. That's who are, that they are our, they are, are cause our pain, not earthquakes and ty typhoons and so on. You have that in Central America. So this is not, Jews are not suffering from this. Everybody knows that Jews suffer from the hatred of the world. Why? We actually trigger it. We trigger anti-Semitism. It's not that anti-Semites are off the hook. We're told in Tanakh that God's going to deal with the with those who, who who did more harm than they should have, and they they, they they're going to be held accountable. But we actually trigger anti-Semitism by not being a light to the nations. It's an absolute perfect economy, spiritual economy. We we if we jettison the very purpose, the very mandate we're here, that is to bring knowledge of God to the world, and we abandon that. So what happened is the world then turns away from God. If the world turns away from God, what do they do? And they hate God. If they hate God, what do you do? Go to fight war with God? Therefore, you go after the Jewish people. And that's why uh, the Jews suffer from the nations of the world. We really trigger that. And in the end of days, ultimately, it will all the world will reach a state of utopia with the sons of them who despised you, Isaiah 60 verse 14 will come and finally the nations will recognize the truth and they will declare, surely you've inherited lies and vanity when there's no truth. How can a man make unto himself gods when they are not? Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 19. So the role of Jews is very, very unique. That is to bring, and that's what the Jews' job is. The Jew is to be a light nation, is to be a priestly nation. Why? Because I say so? No, because the Tyrus says so, period. And uh, and uh, this is a very unique covenant. It was a covenant that uh, that was, was, was forged by a sovereign act of God, and that covenant is locked in, in a vault in heaven, and it is in the tire of all the world to say. Mm. Anyways, thank you for your question. Wonderful. Okay, let's take this next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Anytime. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to get used to when you're watching it. You really just don't know that there's like a lapse. Caller, can you hear us yet? Hello. Sir. Hey, there you, you are. are. There you are. You are live on the show. Hi, Rabbi. Hey there. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I have a quick question, and I'll get off so it, uh, it doesn't interfere with the uh, the audio. Um, I would love to get your opinion on the similarities and differences between the three Abrahamic religions and their similar end time narratives, um, such as Ben Yosef, Ben David. Um, you know, the Antichrist, Jesus, um, and then Islam, the Dajjal, the Mahdi, and Isa. Um, and I would just love to know uh, how you feel about that. Thank you. Could you do me a favor? Do, do this for me, sure. sweetheart. Because, I mean, I can speak for an hour on the eschatology of the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims each <laughs> hour. I can speak all day on it. So is this, could you kind of narrow that down a little bit for me so that I but, could... But what if I, want, what if I want to hear you talk for an hour? <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm yeah, just... <laughs> the problem is that I didn't oh. pay. You know, okay. So I, I, I just, uh, give, just give me okay, a, here, little, I'll, I'll, a little more. Okay, sorry. It's, it's kind of hard to hear you, but I'll, I'll, I'll narrow it down. I, I, then I would love to know about specifically... What what the Torah says, what the Talmud says, specifically about Ben Yosef and Ben David. I, I, that's what I'm probably most interested in. But thank you so much. Okay, very good. And so for all the viewers uh -oh. out there who are interested in all that type of stuff, too, uh, I have another show 
uh, another show set up for uh, uh, world religions at a different time. So you'll check the YouTube channel out for that. So, uh, all right, Rabbi, take this one. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. So, I mean, the end of days in all Abrahamic religions is when all the wrongs are made right. The question is, what is wrong and what is right? And that's, you know, that's uh, the distinction is on many, many levels. So you're asking me, what is the Mashiach ben David and the Mashiach ben Yosef? That's what you're asking me. That's how you decide to you want to go with that. Right, right. So, all right. So we have this question might might me guarantee it. There are many people listening and going, what? I thought there's only one Messiah. What? The Jews believe in two messiahs? Oh no. I thought I heard I thought I heard it all. That was two messiahs. Why how did the Jews come up with this stuff? Okay. So I what happens is that folks are whatever I mean, my fault, I mean, I'm not teaching enough. So people this confuses people, so let's be very clear. I want to use the word Mashiach in a very uh, conventional sense. Okay, there is it means in in a conventional sense, there's a Mashiach who is from the house of David, to whom um, the Jewish people are going to return. Hosea chapter three, verse four and five. Um, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24 and 25. And this is the Mashiach. When we use that term conventionally, the Mashiach ben Yosef is not the Mashiach in any conventional sense. So, okay, so we'll stop just there, okay? There is one Mashiach from who's a descendant, a great-grandson of of King David. He will be like David, he's even called David, and he will restore the Davidic throne in a time when the world will reach a perfect state, when the world will turn uh, back to God because he will rebuke many nations. Isaiah, the first four passages of Isaiah chapter two. Um, the nations will turn to God, they will flow to Jerusalem, Zion will go forth the Torah and and the word of God from Jerusalem. Okay, period. That's what the Mashiach is doing. The Mashiach is going to inspire the world to do repentance to uh, the Jews to turn back the Torah. Read it. He's called the Prince, and all at the throughout the end of the whole book of Ezekiel. Okay, so I want to clear this up because you're going, well, wait, you said there's this other Messiah, son of Joseph. Now, I want to make clear that, I want to make a point. And that is that we, unfortunately, fortunately, it's not relevant whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But we are not using today the conventional language that Tanakh uses. We use different language, just convention changes. In this case, there's actually a reason for it. In Tanakh, the word Mashiach appears 39 times. 39 times. As it turns out, in none of those places is the Mashiach, is the person who's called the Mashiach, the Mashiach who we refer to today. And you're going, Rabbi, I'm totally, totally confused. So you have to, this is where people get in a lot of trouble because they love Hashem very much, but I don't know, Sutton is, he is amazing to getting people to recognize that the Tanakh is the word of God and not study it. He, he is, he is very, very good at what he does. So in Tanakh, the word Mashiach comes through with Moshach, which means to pour, which means someone who oil was poured on his head. Now you might think, oh, that's only the Messiah. No, 
all the Davidic, all the kings had were oil was poured on their head. There was some the priests oil was poured on their head. In fact, the word Mashiach anointed appears more frequently in the book of Leviticus than any other book in Tanakh. Why? Because Leviticus is Tyrus Kahanim. The book of Sefer Vayikra, the third of the five books of Moses, is deals with many, there are many, many things in there, but a very significant part of it is dealing with the laws of the of the priesthood. And therefore, the word Mashiach, whether the Leviticus 4 or 5, it's all over the place. Okay, And there it's referring to priests, the sons of Aaron. But that's not the only application. You can actually have in the book of Samuel where the children of David were Kohanim, priests. Oh, really? Yeah, but they're not priests as the sons of Aaron. You have to be so careful. This is why trouble is everywhere. This is why people who want to seduce you into another faith could easily exploit the fact that Tanakh is using a certain conventional language which is meant to convey one thing, and to, but that convention is not used today. Okay, I'm sorry for this if the introduction was a little longer here, but my gosh, I, I, I don't want you to drown. I, I, I don't want you to drown. I, I want you to live. I want you to breathe. I want you to feel the fire. I want you to see the light. I don't want you to live in darkness. I'm truly really groping in a, in a, in a, in a place where, where is, where that is ungodly. I want you to understand this. So let's, let's go back here. There in, when we talk about Mashiach without any, modifier, it means that the king from the house of David was the ultimate fulfillment of the messianic age that is promised that will usher in a time when the world will turn to God and the and the nations will speak in of one accord. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, of a pure speech, a time when the temple will be built. Look at the last three passages of Ezekiel chapter 37. A time when the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Read Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. But this will take place when the sign, when the heir from the house of David will restore to, to his proper place, to his throne. And the temple will be built. The whole end of Ezekiel is a, from 40 all the way to the end of the book, is all about this very copious details about the building of the third temple. Uh, the coming of Mashiach will be preceded by the coming of Elijah the prophet. We'll read the end of the book of Malachi. But the key point is, that's the Mashiach. Okay? In Tanakh, he's not called the Mashiach. He is called the prince. You'll find that more than 20 times at the end of the book of Ezekiel, all over the place. Now, so now that we, I made this speech, in fact, just to make you crazy, you can have a non-Jew is called the Mashiach, which means he is anointed. It doesn't really mean oil had to be poured on his head, but he's anointed to carry out the will of God. Cyrus is called God's Mashiach in Isaiah 45, verse 1. Verse 1, because he's the one who gives the command. He is the Mashiach who gives the command to rebuild and restore Yerushalayim, which ties into Daniel 9, which the church rips to pieces and essentially molests the, the last three passages of that ninth chapter. So precious, so unfortunate that this had to happen. Anyways, um, so therefore the, the word Mashiach in Tanakh referred to a non-Jew. Let's now now, in rabbinic literature, it, in the Talmud, we have the Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, the son of Joseph. But the Talmud is not using our conventional language, meaning the Mashiach is the Mashiach, the son of David, for whom we wait. But rather, it's for any person who has a leadership position is called a Mashiach in, in, by the sages of Israel. 
And therefore, there is a figure who is such an individual. He's not the Mashiach. He's called Mashiach because, again, our sages of blessed memory are using a, a linguistic convention that we don't use today. Jews who are knowledgeable, and not just Jews who are knowledgeable, non-Jews who, who, B'nai Noach, who study, then they learn this too. It's very good for them to know. So what will happen at the end of days is there will be a war. We know that there'll be a war, Mechemes Gog, Me'eretz Magog, a people called Gog, the land of Magog. What does that mean beyond the scope? But the key is, they are the enemies of God, and they're going to go to war with who? Switzerland? No. They're going to war with Saudi Arabia, filled with oil. Uh, no, Qatar, natural guest, not interested. They're going to war with Jerusalem. Jerusalem has no oil that anybody knows of, no natural gas, but it has the oil of Hashem. It has that spiritual oil, is that oil that illuminates that great Mount Moriah. That's what we're all looking forward to, that oil, not the oil that's sitting in Texas and Alaska and Venezuela. Listen carefully. So what must happen when the Mashiach comes, in order to trigger the coming of the Mashiach, is the Jews must repent. There has to be a trigger that will cause the Jew to repent. Now, we hope that the Jewish people will repent because they recognize the God of Israel. We are seeing today, in my opinion, and for those who know, know, a revival of Jewish literacy among the children of Israel that is has not been seen since the days of Hezekiah Melech, since the days of Hezekiah, meaning for 2,700 years. There's a revival in the world, particularly in the Holy Land and around the world, where people who whose families were not religious who are turning, who are becoming religious, uh, people who are not Jewish who are turning. There's so much conversion to Judaism today. People, the biggest complaint people have is, why is it so hard to convert to Judaism? And we're not even trying. Okay. This has not happened since going back to the building of the Second Temple, anything remotely resembling this. Because we are living now, what I, I think is almost certainly in prophetic times, where prophecy is unfolding before our eyes right now. Okay. Now, key is that the Jewish people in mass have to turn back to Hashem, have to repent. They have to turn back, turn away from sin. This is necessary. And there are triggers that would cause people to repent. The, now, the, the term Mashiach ben Yosef, you will find nowhere in Tanakh, although it's alluded to in Tanakh. It's the the idea that Joseph will be a fire, we find in the book of Obadiah, that Joseph will play a role in destroying and defeating Edom, absolutely. And you find a description of this person who dies in battle in Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12, after all, is the description of the end time war, but read it from the beginning don't read it from a Jews for Jesus tract, which starts you in verse 10. Then you can go and you'll find yourself in a spiritual bathroom. If you get to start from verse 1, you read through, and you see that nations will come against your Shlayim, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be a heavy, burdensome stone to all those who come against it. It'll be a cauldron of uh, of it will all the nations who come against your Shlayim will be destroyed. And the weakest of the children of Israel will be like David, even like the angel of the Lord of hosts. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. Okay, got it? So there's going to be an end time war where nations will come against Yishlaim. This is an amazing thing, because this prophecy, like Ezekiel's prophecy, is two and a half thousand years old. And you got to ask yourself a question. When I turn on the news every day, what am I watching? Well, I would say... A great thirty percent of the news. I don't care where you are. I was in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. I remember just turning on the news, whatever it was, and they were talking about the Holy Land. For the for at least a third of the news was about the Holy Land. I don't know what station it was. It's all they were talking about. Why? I mean, they're why not the Swiss Alps? Gorgeous. 
Why not that they're talking about, you know, who God knows what? No, that this is the center of everything right now. And this is where all the world is focused today. And if you don't know this, that means that you're living, you've been living under a rock. That means you just landed in a spaceship. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be cute, but you know I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not I'm being ethnocentric here. This is the reality. The reality is all about Yerushalayim. That's what we're living in today. This is it. Okay, this is what the whole world is focused on. And this is what Tanakh says. This is very improbable because Jerusalem has no natural resources. There's no beautiful beachfront in Jerusalem. There's, there's no natural resources there. It's all spiritual resources. And that's what the world is consumed with, period, end. Now, what happens in the, mid, in the midst of this battle in which Jerusalem, the enemies of Jerusalem, will be destroyed? There will be a defender or defenders of Yishlayim who will die in the midst of this war. Now, here we're getting into an area that you would have to go to the Talmud because it, that's the source for it. And, and uh, it's tractate uh, Sukkah uh, and it's uh, folio 52. Yeah. And there you read about Meshach ben Yosef. If you want to read about Meshach ben Yosef more elaborately, you would um, Rabbeinu Sajagon Olav Shalom. Great. It's, it's written about a lot, a lot of places. Rav Sajagon, who lived in the early Middle Ages, so he was a giant. So he wrote a, a sefer called Munas Videos, which are it teaches. The fundamental coalesces the fundamental teachings of the Jewish faith. When when the sages did this, they weren't inventing anything. They were just simply coalescing it to make it easy for people to understand. Just drawing it together so you can coalesce. It has been translated into English language uh, by I think Rabbi Bleich or something. It's available. Uh, <clears throat> Sajigon uh, beliefs and faith. Something I don't know. I don't know anything. I, 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 we didn't learn it in English, uh, but it's it is has been translated. The key is that a, either a a group of soldiers defending Yerushalayim or a single um, a single um, soldier or military leader dies in this war, who's a leader or are soldiers among the good people defenders of Jerusalem. This death of one person or a number of people, there are two opinions on this, triggers a consternation, a sadness, and a mass mourning among the children of Israel. It hits us right in the heart. Now, the context is it's the end time war, Zechariah 12. It's not someone dying across 2,000 years ago. That's nonsense. As Jews didn't, Jerusalem wasn't saved. It was destroyed then. Nothing to do with that. In fact, the Christian Bible misappropriates Zechariah twelve ten and has it in John nineteen thirty seven is talking about Roman soldiers. Forget about it. Let's just let's just let's get rid of all that. But I know for a lot of people this is confusing. So the key point is that a great person or a or soldiers who are very important to us die in the midst of this battle. This then triggers the nation to be said. How do you know I'm telling you this is true? It says it, mm -hmm. that they will mourn over him as one mourns over a firstborn son. And in fact, it says, if you want to know what what kind of mourning, it'll be like what happened to Hadrimonim in the Valley of Megiddo. Well, what happened to the Valley of Megiddo? And this is misunderstood in Revelation 16. Sorry, I don't mean to bring in the Christian Bible. They misunderstood it. They're saying, if you want to know what's going to be like, Remember what? Remember the guy, the person who was killed in the Valley of Megiddo. Who was killed in the Valley of Valley Megiddo? Yeshio, Josiah, it caused the nation to sad, to cry, to weep, to repent. So the death of the Mashiach Ben Yosef, he's not the Mashiach in our sense. Maybe we shouldn't even use that word. The death of soldiers or a individual in this war causes so much pain that it causes the nation to turn back to God, to mourn. It says literally, 
it says they will turn back to God because of the mourning. Read it in context. I have a chapter on this in volume one. Let's get biblical as well. This death, this death caused the nation to repent. Why is it important that the Jews repent in order for the Mashiach ben David to come? Because it says so. Where? Read Isaiah chapter 59. Verse 19 and 20. And a redeemer will come to Zion uh, to those in Jacob who return from their sin. Okay? That's what it says. The text says, Isaiah says, that the Jews will repent. Jacob, the, ch the Jews will repent from their sin, and that will trigger the coming of the redeemer. By the way, Paul doesn't like that verse at all. Why? Because in Paul's Christology, nobody could repent. No one could bring about their own salvation for their own, for their own initiative. It's impossible. Paul's idea of salvation, his, his concept of justification, which is, was articulated much later by other uh, Christian I'm using this word in italics and in quotation mark thinkers. Is, so Paul changes it. Compare Romans 11, 26. Paul says that the Redeemer will come to Zion and turn away the hearts of the hearts, turn back the hearts of Jacob. That's not what the text says. The text doesn't say that the Redeemer will turn the hearts of they will turn the hearts of Jacob away from sin. It doesn't say that. It says the Redeemer will come to those who return from sin. This is all you're going, what's the difference? It's the difference, all the difference in the world. The difference is the Jews must repent of their own initiative. Now, does God use an instrument, all sorts of instruments, in order to trigger repentance? Yes. But ultimately, the Jews have to repent. And this is a key concept in Judaism, which is, again, is misunderstood. It's in Tanakh. And that is that when people die, it causes people to repent. I know. I know as a rabbi that people don't take their faith seriously. And then Nebuch, Nebuch, unfortunately, up, they bury a parent. And suddenly, they, they, they're, they, they're, they're in synagogue now every day praying. And they become more religious and take, take their faith more seriously. That's what happens. People begin to repent when they realize their own mortality, and that tr that triggers it. So therefore, this death will trigger the repentance of the Jewish people who will turn back to God, and that in turn will trigger the coming of the Mashiach ben David. That's the Mashiach, and that's what Mashiach ben David. There aren't two messiahs. There are actually thousands of people who are priests. I'm one of them. I'm a descendant of Aaron. Uh, there are thousands of people from the house of David. My great-grandmother of blessed memory was from the house of David. So was Rashi from the house of David. So was Rabbi Gamliel from the house of David. Okay? So we get all that. People are just... Uh, that's what Mashiach ben Yosef, you have to understand that this is lowercase m. It just means someone who is anointed to bring about the repentance of the Jewish people. One caveat it isn't necessary. If the Jewish people will repent on their own, then it will not, this will not be necessary because all these kind of negative, it's not negative intrinsically, but all these things that may be necessary to cause the Jews to repent, if they repent on their own and don't require this, this very painful stimulation, then it won't be necessary. And just like the people of Nineveh, the city was not overturned 40 days later because they repented. Jer Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. This does not have to occur. But this is a prophecy of what God will use in order to trigger the coming of the true Mashiach. May he arrive. May we see the redemption of the world. Bimheira biomenu quickly in our time. Thank you for that question. Yes, I mean, I mean, well, it's been a great show, Rabbi. I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, all the viewers, for, for tuning in. Uh, I'll let you know. I believe we should be good to go for next uh, uh, for next weekend, if all goes well. Uh, like I said, Rabbi, we'll have to uh, uh, let us see how the schedule goes with the game with the Holy no, Day. No, next week is fine. 
next this coming it's the so, weeks after that that it becomes crazy okay so one week from today we'll be live and uh yeah so that'll be good unless something drastic comes up so this whole every week schedule yeah is... if Mashiach comes this show is done <laughs> yeah for sure for sure so uh uh what we're going to try to do it every week with rabbi singer uh but uh no guarantees on that yet but that's what we're going to shoot for so I really appreciate all your time. And remember, two-volume book set and all the DVDs and stuff you can find at Amazon.com or directly at his website, outreachjudaism.org. So uh, thank you all, and we will look forward to seeing you guys again, hopefully one week from today, same time, same place. Shalom, shalom. Rabbi, I love you. Love you, people. Take care. Peace. <laughs> take care. Shoo me, call, shoo me, call, shoo me, call, shoo me, call,